next speaker uh, comes to us from San Francisco. He's the uh, he was the first he was a designer at Mint, uh, which ended up getting sold to Intuit, um, and he also was designer residence at Bessemer, uh, a VC firm. He's now the co-founder of uh, Brigade Media, and he's going to talk to us about why design matters. Let's hear it for Jason Petorti. Come on. Excited to be here. Um, this presentation uh, it covers it covers a lot. Uh, it covers design at a pretty high level, and um, really, as uh, founders and entrepreneurs, I want to give you guys just a lot of things to think about. So, um, if you want to get ready to take notes, do that. Um, you can also tweet and ask questions throughout the presentation, and um, I can get to those after. Um, and uh, if we have time, we can get some Q and A. So, three big topics I want to cover. Uh, first one is uh, why good design matters, um, and then where to focus. You guys have limited time, um, limited resources, so you have to choose where to employ those resources in the best way possible so that you get business success. Um, and then what makes, uh, just some things about what makes for a great design process. And, okay. All right, why good design matters. Um, money, that's basically why it matters, that's why it's so important. Um, innovation produces a lot of value. The, uh, this is an Apple store, uh, it's one Fifth Avenue. Uh, Apple has become synonymous with good design over the past, uh, uh, I guess since, since Steve came back and introduced the iMac is really when uh, things started to get going. This Apple store, um, compared with anything else in a, in a mall store, a lot of the times you guys see Apple stores in the mall, they produce 17 times more revenue per square foot than any other store in that mall. They do about $6,000 per square foot. Um, reason being, those stores are very intentionally designed. They have geniuses that are there. They're not just like salespeople. There's a genius bar, so you can go in there. And even when you're, even when you're getting help on an Apple product, they can sell you more Apple product, right? But very well designed, very thoughtfully designed, and uh, they produce a ton of value. If you were to go and say, hey, I want to start a shoe business tomorrow to an investor, they'd roll their eyes and probably kick you out the door. Um, but given um, something like that maybe is a more commodity type business, what are you going to do that's different? Um, I thought this is an especially appropriate example. Um, Zappos was purchased by Amazon um, while it was about a billion dollars, right? Reason being, um, one of the reasons, and uh, Tony would know a lot more than I would on this, um, well-designed, well-crafted customer experience all the way through. Um, is, the, is the visual design or the look and feel of the site really like all that special? Not really. Um, but what really sets them apart is how they did thought about the customer experience end to end. One of the, my favorite things that Zappos did was uh, set expectations appropriately. They would, when you go and check out, um, you would say like, okay, like I want this standard shipping. And then all of a sudden you get an email a little while later, boom, you're awesome. It's gonna come to you in a day, it's free, like enjoy. And then everything with the returns and all that stuff is very thoughtfully done. They really figured out how do we make shoes work online and focus the design uh, efforts in terms of designing how that experience works for the customer, scale it across the organization, and build a tremendous amount of value doing so. Um, this is a picture of Yodley Money Center, um, only about 10 years ago. Um, if you guys uh, know, Yodley was the, uh, the back engine that uh, powered Mint. They built a system where they connected um, to you know, thousands of different banks, really focused their efforts there to the building of a technical infrastructure. And that was what they, they intended to do. Now, there was um, a, a front end system that a consumer could use and they could log in and they could see credit cards and bank balances and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, wasn't great, which gave uh, us an opportunity at Mint. Um, a couple of things gave us an opportunity. Um, one was that uh, Intuit at the time, you know, they wanted you to uh, enter everything. Uh, they didn't really have robust bank connectivity, they wanted you to do all the work. Um, so we said, we're going to stick with the following values. We're going to keep things simple. Um, we're going to uh, basically get rid of all the unnecessary features that uh, people do not need. So think about going from like, Microsoft Word to Google Docs. So we stripped it down. The user was not going to have to do any work. It was a core principle. It didn't, didn't really deviate from it. Minimal work required. It was your personal finances and autopilot. And uh, we wanted to make it 
Um, we want to make this feel good. We want to make this fun. Like managing your money is not an activity that I really want to do. It's not like going to a party. This is like, it shouldn't have to be so much work. We want to make it simple. We want to make the insights easy, readily available. And we set out to craft an experience that hit those values and you know delivered a lot of value. Um, and raised uh, on 35 million, we exited 470. So we, uh, we 5x uh, 5x the value, and it was largely on making a simpler product, focusing on the experience, and then uh, doing some tremendous uh, marketing and PR to get the word out, get the story out there. Another interesting thing we did at Mint was, uh, which is applicable to a lot of startups, is where, where do we focus? Um, you know, you guys are always hearing about minimum viable product. For us. Um, we need to start simple. We can't build every, we can't build a super you know complicated financial app. We would have never launched. We would have launched um, probably by the time we exited. So we focused on the um, most simple financial picture possible, which was a college student. But we understood that okay, like what, you know, who has maybe a bank account, a credit card, a savings account? It's probably college kids, right? They don't have a home mortgage or an auto loan or a lot of other products. Start simple. Knew exactly who we were going after. Got it out there. Got it in the right blocks. Built the right partnerships. We're able to launch a tech crunch and get um, a ton of pickup right after that based on the ground relay with the, the audience, we knew our customer. Jared Spool, one of the luminaries in this space, he runs user interface engineering. There's so much great reading material there. It's uh, uie.com, I encourage you guys to check it out if you want to learn a ton about design. Um, he's been working in this space for a very long time. He's worked with a ton of design teams and figured out what makes them really good. Um, a definition that he came up with for design uh, within the last few years is that it's the rendering of intent. So, uh, what does your team really intend to do, right? Um, so, for example, you're going to find the intent through activities like user research, uh, basically listening to your customers, like figuring out what they have to say. Uh, market opportunity, you know, you are going to enter the market, you know, that's this size, and where's the opportunity there, where's the, where's the right for disruption, how can you make it better? And you have a vision. You have a vision in terms of how you make the world better. And these are ways where uh, you get on the same page with your team, and you figure, okay, given all this information, what are we going to do? What, to, what, where are we going to go? What are we going to build? And in rendering intent, um, this is what you end up coming out with. You're going to come out with, you know, you're going to come out with some wireframes, prototypes, uh, you're going to come out with an end product. And getting on the same page and uh, having that right intent is critical in order to get a, uh, get a well designed product shaped. Another thing that is very important when you guys are working through this, when you guys are making decisions on where we want to focus, um, why should you build this feature? It comes down to these two. If you can't find a user need and a business goal tied up in there, you probably don't want to do it. Uh, design is not just about the visual. I think, I think we're all past that. You know, design is about the business. Design is about problem solving and building value. And this is how you need to look at it. Not just like, hey, let's like make it all pretty and then we're gonna, we're gonna create a lot of value that way. So, where are we gonna focus? Um, this is the market maturity uh, framework. And it basically tells you that uh, what you guys all have markets you want to get into. There's, there's, there may be competitors, there may not be. Um, and you need to understand where your market is to decide what investments you want to make in design, which, which stage. So if the thing you want to build is truly remarkable and does not exist, you don't really have to worry about making it pretty or making the interactions wonderful. You just have to make it work because it's much better than like anything else that's out in the market. It's like going from um, wireless, it's like going from uh, cord to wireless power, uh, something like that. So the fact that you can do that, it's a pretty big deal. And until there's competitors and a whole host of other conditions, you, you can just worry about making that thing work and shipping it. Um, and then the next phase is features. So it's like the word processor, right? First we have the word processor. And then, okay, so now there's other word processors, and that's not quite enough. Well, let's add more features to it. Let's add a spell check. Let's add a grammar check. Let's add um, you know, rich layout. Let's add photos. Let's do all these different things. Um, and then before you know it, in a classic example, Microsoft Word is incredibly bloated, and people probably use only 10% of the features that are in that product. And that's when you move into the experience phase of, uh, of technology, where um, you need to figure out what is that core, you know, 
what is the core thing that is most useful, most interesting, solves you know, most of the problem for people, and you start slowing down. The last phase is integration, so that's like the digital camera. It's like most of us had digital cameras on our phones, and there are sp still specialty digital cameras, but a lot of technology ultimately gets integrated into other pieces of technology. So mobile phone, for example, first it was possible, then we added SMS, and we added all these different kinds of things to the phones, we these big feature phones, what they were called back in the day. And then all of that, uh, when the iPhone, the first iPhone launched, it actually had less features than the feature phones at the time. But it was incredibly easy to use, it had a touch screen, um, and, and it just, what it did, it did less, but it did better. And now it's, it's funny because now the phone is like a little app uh, in a, more, a much more robust iPhone, uh, you know, 10 years later almost. MP3 player went for the same evolution. First, there was this thing that exists, you guys remember, it used like little SD cards and it was really neat, you'd hook it to your computer and, and, and it replaced the disc man. It was this little tiny thing, it was incredible and you could load songs onto it. Not a great experience, but for the early adopters, hey, it was, it was cool and uh, it was pretty innovative. And then stuff like the Creative Zen came along. Well, we're going to add radio to it and we're going to add voice recording to it and let's see all the different things, we're going to add more storage and all that and there's a lot of MP3 players around that. And then, you know, as you guys know, the iPod came along, did not have nearly as many features as that Zen. It focused on the music experience at the end. So they had iTunes, there was, a, there was a store. So basically the entire experience around buying and listening to music was, most of that was pretty well encapsulated by an offering from Apple. So they focused on experience, not features. Um, and now, like the MP3 players, again, it's, it's a lot of the, uh, the smartphone is eating a lot of stuff. It is now the little red music app uh, on our smartphones. So be aware of where you guys are. I imagine most of us are probably in the experience phase, uh, which is going to require some more design, but, but maybe not. So if you're in a technology or feature market, just making it work, satisfying a desire, um, hitting that core need, that's what you need to focus on. Make sure that it has utility. Um, if you have a more mature market, there's competitors, you need to differentiate, then interaction design and visual design become much more important. Making it usable, making it easily, uh, you know, making it you know, more pleasurable to use, building a connection with the customer, building loyalty. If you are an, uh, a Wi-Fi hotspot um, where there are no more Wi-Fi hotspots, there's nothing else, there's no alternative, you pretty much got that business, okay? But we are not all that, right? Those things can be horrible, the interfaces can, can be like hard to use, it's not gonna matter if you have more else to go. You'll put up with it because you need internet. So, this is always the classic example where it's like, oh, you don't need good design because there's Craigslist and Craigslist did really well. Okay, well, Craigslist started in 1995 um, when the alternative was, I need to sell something like, I need to go and, you know, put an ad in the Chronicle or, you know, go and post an ad in a newspaper and hopefully somebody calls it. So, the internet was just starting to, you know, pick up and Craig Newmark said, okay, well, all this stuff could be online, right? So, let's put it all online, let's make it free and, you know, over, over a long period of time, it built up into, you know, an incredible property. Um, it's still one of the, one of the highest ranked sites uh, in, in the country. But that was because of where the market was. This is a technology market. And making this possible and making it free was huge. That was it. It doesn't really have to be, doesn't have to have the best experience design, so it doesn't have to have the best, best visual design in the world because of the alternative. But now, in 2015, like, the existence of the computer versus the newspaper is not enough. And as you can see, there's a lot of other players that have come into this space and tried to make these individual experiences and individual marketplaces work much better. Um, and they're creating a lot of value doing it. So you can't just in 2015 say, well, I'm, I'm going to build a marketplace online. I'm going to have it look like Craigslist because Craigslist did it this way. You have to know what environment you're in. And now, um, Airbnb just raised money at a $20 billion valuation, which is one little segment of that you know, online uh, housing market. And eBay just bought stuff up for 310 million, actually not just about 10 years ago. But um, this is, you know, this is the acknowledgement that in the experienced market, you can like you build these really great things like um, stuff like as a, you know, you can download, you can go and print the tickets out, um, you can figure where your seat is, all things that Craigslist still has, um, just a whole long list. Uh, it's just a long plain text, you know, listing. 
but lots of value when we built it by building better experiences. Uh, Uber launched in about 2010, and at the time, the competition was, um, well, it was just extremely painful in San Francisco to get a cab. So you could um, have a cell phone, and you could call the dispatcher, and you could tell the dispatcher where you are, and the dispatcher would say, well, what's the address? I, I don't know the address. I'm in the corner of here now. You've got to get the address. Okay, I'm going to wander around the street, and I'm going to look for a number to tell that dispatcher so that he can get a cab to may or may not show up to see me like in any, any amount of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 5 minutes, whatever, right? So this, is, this was painful. And these guys, like here, Travis, recognized an opportunity. He said, well, what if we just, there was a magic button where you push it and the car shows up. Okay, so let's go build that. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to have the best interaction design. It doesn't have to have the best brand. If you basically tell people in San Francisco, hey, like, try this app. You, know, you push your button and the car shows up. Boom. It's pretty magical. It's pretty exciting. And uh, obviously very successful. Move forward um, into 2012. They had to really like start to you know move the create a little more features, more price points. The competition was coming in from everywhere. The cabs were fighting back. Um, there's Lyft. There's all kinds of different things. All kinds of different ride sharing people have entered the market because they're like, oh, well, we can do this too. Um, the technology itself, the app itself, isn't isn't that amazing, but but it's it's possible to do. There's not a unique proprietary piece of technology. But if you can get the supply and you can get an app working, you can start a ride sharing company. So with more competitors and uh, you know increasing uh, price and, and and all different experiences that the other apps are doing, um, Uber's had to adapt or they would have died. So they you know they built more offerings, they built this brand, and it's recognizing that the world in 2015 is much different than when they launched. Uh, so product design, interactive design, visual design, all come into play in their latest offerings. Square payments market. Payments market is incredibly, uh, incredibly competitive. There's, there's huge entrenched interests, and they're not just going to roll over. Um, Verifone is not going to go. Oh, that's neat. Like somebody built a little thing on a phone. Like we're not going to do that. We're not going to bother with that. We're just going to sit on our hand and let some startup, you know, come in and kick our ass. It's not going to happen. Square need to raise a lot of money to go into the payment space. Need to focus on both their, their product, so the actual reader. They need to have the, the interactions be incredible, like the whole you know the signature on the hand. They make the whole software hardware experience really great, really easy to use, and you know build a brand that people would trust. Anytime you're dealing with money, um, trustworthiness is very important, um, less so in other industries. Uh, especially true for Mint when we launched. Our competitors at the time were like Gizio and Wasabi, and um, well, mostly on adoption, but. If you just put some form on the internet and say, please enter your credit card information, people are going to bounce. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to work. So building credibility through visual was very important for these guys. And they're still, they're still like, you know, fighting, uh, fighting a lot of players. So that said, um, some tips for you guys in terms of what makes for a great proxy. A lot of things for you guys to think about. And, uh, and please like to me questions if, uh, if I can help for the level of you guys. I think, I personally think that every design should start with a great story. And um, we, as entrepreneurs, we love to build stuff. We often love to get right to it. I am, I am really bad at this. I will just go right to the UI sometimes. I just, I have an idea. I want to get it out there. But we've got to understand and got to build a great story. Why are we doing this thing? So um, first of all, I mean, the most important thing is who is your customer? You have to start here. And you figure this out. Um, having you have open uh, end conversations to develop empathy, very important. So um, surveys are not not that useful. You need to just go and talk to people and listen to them. Building empathy is key. The only way you build empathy is through having conversations one on one. Don't bring your phone. Take notes. Just like have that real conversation. And what you want to get out of that conversation, there's three key things. Um, you're going to find needs, actual needs that they have. Um, what are their pain points? And what are their behaviors today? Uh, a lot of people make mistakes. Now, oh, they hear something about personas, and I want to build this persona. And um, you know, Jan is, you know, she's 35, and she drives this kind of car, and she lives on this kind of street. It, like that, that stuff, unless it actually helps you make design decisions, it does not matter. You need to find needs, pain, and actual behaviors until before you can like craft a product that actually like 
helps to do this. And if you guys have hypotheses, and that's what you have, you have hypotheses, you do not, you're not the source of universal truth. You have an idea as a founder, you gotta go test it. And um, you know, do be careful with what users will tell you back. Um, they may meet you and they're like, oh yeah, yeah that sounds like a good idea. Um, you know, they may, they may not be being truthful. Um, judge body language, see how enthusiastic they are, dig into why, don't take stuff at face value. Um, Aaron, Aaron Katz, when he was uh, coming up with Mint, um, he didn't just go in the room and start coding. He came up with the idea, he kind of like kept working on it on paper for a long time. He came up with a lot of different messaging ideas as to like, well, okay, well, I, I personally, Aaron had this pain point of, um, you know, Quicken being a pain and like, you know, he let it go for a few months and then he came back to it and it was totally out of date, right? So he could have just started there and said, I'm just going to solve my own problem. And, you know, that's a valid approach. But he didn't do that. He needed to figure out, of course, how to message this idea to the people. He needed to figure out what were their biggest pain points. So he went out to the Mountain View train station and just started talking to people. Had conversations with people waiting for the train and great people to usability test and talk to because they know else to go. They cannot run away from you. <laughs> and out of all that, you really distill the essence of what is the problem. And it may not be the problem you think you set out to solve in the first place. You may have to adjust. You may have to you know, pivot, if you will. You may have to go a different direction. But what you're doing through this process is, is getting your story straight and, uh, and de-risking uh, your business. Why you versus your competitor? If you're in a competitive market, you need to know like what is the incredible argument you can make as to why someone will use you versus someone somebody else. Is it a technology differentiator? Um, is it a marketing visual differentiator? But, but why? Timing is pretty important. Uh, I remember a couple years ago at South by Southwest, there were all these like, video startups. We're gonna do like you know real time video, and meanwhile, um, where are they now? Quick does not exist anymore. I don't know what happened to Justin TV, but all of a sudden Periscope and Meerkat just exploded. Why? Because saturation of LTE networks has absolutely made that possible. It just wouldn't have worked a couple years ago in the networks that we had. Um, and how? Um, how will you credibly go out and solve this and can you communicate this to a prospective customer? Um, check out positioning. Um, it's a marketing classic. It's a short read. But this is uh, in a crowded market. This is what you have to get right, in my opinion, to have a successful, uh, to be able to basically tell the story of your product and have something work. These are the key ingredients. It's called positioning statement. And it's something that every company I work with has to have. So, a lot of the times we just think about our products and we think about them um, in silos. That's all, that's all we're dealing with. Here's the product that's going to do this thing. You guys have to um, get out a little bit more and consider the entire context, the entire scenario of how your product will be used and which points of that entire journey will you guys handle. So this is something we did at Brigade. Um, this is a day project. We went to a couple of coffee shops and we were interested to see how people were going to use group chat. Like how do they use it today? So we talk to them, we ask them like how do you how do you make decisions? Like how do you, if you want to go out to eat, how does this work? Uh, what do you use group chat for? We were just out there just trying to figure out like where is the market now in terms of group chat? Like for example, like Facebook Messenger is a great example or WhatsApp. Like learning about that entire experience. And what we did is we built this general journey map and um, here's a few ways that you know what we had in mind could be used. We broke down the big themes. Uh, notifications to a certain area, discussions in a certain phase of the journey, answers and insights, um, and then resolution. And you can't build every part of that experience. There's a whole set of things that happen outside of it, but what you can do is you can understand um, the entire activity and figure out the points where you can be most successful, where your software can most help the situation. Um, for us, it was this core loop and some of these other things we kind of threw out there, and we decided we're just gonna focus on building a really good uh, decision-making system, and that's, that's what we're going to focus on. That's, that's going to be our differentiator, given where the market the rest of the market is. I encourage you guys to figure out, um, go look up mental models. This is also very important. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a word that's thrown around um, often not the, way, the right way. This particular mental model is how you get ready in the morning. It's pretty classic. But if you were to ask that, like, okay, how do I get ready in the morning? Well, you know, I, I get up and, and I have breakfast and go to work. Okay, there's, there's actually quite a bit more to that than usually we think about. And that can be broken out into these big, these big themes. And these towers are kind of like smaller than still. 
Um, but what you have here is like behaviors that go across the time you get ready to go to work. And then here's all the different ways to support. I think this was done for Procter and Gamble. And Procter and Gamble pretty much wanted to sell you all this stuff. So they wanted to solve for everything. Now for us as, as startups, we can probably solve for, for one thing. But we do understand the context in which our products uh, for doing the right thing, or understand the context in which our products are being used. Um, and uh, yeah, mobile versus desktop is an important context to consider. That's pretty classic. Um, now, are you in line at Starbucks or are you sitting at home behind your desk? Um, one of the realizations we had at Mint was uh, when are our customers actually like doing their financial work? And what we found was a lot of times it was moms and they were they were doing this stuff like in between like taking care of their kids and and uh, and cooking dinner, and we were really concerned about security. So our product was logging logging people out every five minutes. It was incredibly frustrating, and you're not going to know that like sitting in like a cubicle in Mountain View, just like trying to figure out like what's the most secure thing. You're not going to figure that stuff out unless you like actually just spend time with your user. Okay, there have been so many wonderful advances in this area of validation, cheap learning, and lowering risk in the last couple of years. It's, it's really great. Um, Johnny I have process about designing, prototyping, making, and keeping keep those processes together. So um, another product, kicking around a brigade, um, we, we just launched uh, a new feature, and this is what our designer had been started with. And this is something that anybody can do. There's, there's no like super select pixels or animations or anything. This is like the story. This is the story. This is real world activity. And how does our UI like intersect with that? How does it help the user get from one point to the other? And from something like that, then you can get into wireframes. And again, stuff you guys can do. This is an example of uh, you know, a bunch of wireframes on a page, and you actually have a phone that you can just like move around. So the user can like tap and rack and they talk to you, and you can kind of move things around and show what this is going to do. This is before I've done anything on the computer. I haven't done a pixel, haven't spent any time on it, and you can learn cheaply. And that's the key here when you're starting out in the design process, is to learn as cheap as possible. And then at some point you get to a computer, still keep it low five, you know, boxes and arrows. And then from something like that, there's all these wonderful tools. Marvell is a great tool now where you can actually throw all this stuff in, you can connect it in Visions and other, you can connect the different buttons, different UIs, and you can build it without any, without a single line of code. It's all just it's all just there for you. You can even do it in Keynote or PowerPoint. Something else, another great tool that helps you learn. So now you can put a phone in front of someone and just watch the user. Um, the next generation of tools now will be more sophisticated. It actually lets you prototype like really beautiful interactions again without any code. Pixie uh, and form are two examples that come to mind. I like to break interactions down to this. As you're watching people use your product, use your prototypes, um, obvious is wonderful. They're just clicking on it, not really saying too much, but okay, I get it, I get it. Um, if they maybe stop and ask, hey, what, is this, what does this do? Uh, don't answer them. Say, what do you think it does? Most important question in a, in a user voice, what do you think it does? And they say, well, I think it, I think it does this. And they're right. You're matching their expectations. They've intuited it. they figured it out. Um, if they don't, or they don't actually want to, or they're afraid of it, it's a problem. So then you, you know, keep going back and forth and, and keep trying again to get it right. Um, I'm picking up the pace because I'm short on time. Um, but only last year did we start to consider the visual. And I'll take you guys through a couple of really great examples. Um, this is the uh, one homepage for Uber. Notice what's not here. And that is anything about it being a private car service. It's all about um, an environment, an image. There's a consistent photography style. There's a type hierarchy. And it's talking about a benefit. And there's a clear call to action. And that's it. Um, Square has gotten to the point where, again, I've gone to this page. I don't see a reader, I don't see uh, the, the, the register apparatus, I don't see any of that. I see um, this is a barber. So they're going after small business and they're just saying it helps more sellers grow their business faster. That's it. Get started, stories, up, up there's products. But it's using this visual and using photography to establish that like relationship with the customer. Oh, I think this is me, this is somebody like me, I get it, I'm going to move forward, I'm going to move forward. Totally different, Forever 21. Like, what makes this work? Uh, Forever 21 is a young women's uh, apparel brand. 
these photos to me anyway feel like Instagram shots. Like know your audience, know like what is going to be responsive and what's going to get them interested in people. Great quote. The thing that people don't understand is that the only way you can be successful with your branding is if you have a great product to sell. People go home and aren't happy, that won't work. Your product has to stand up for itself. So all this like amazing branding stuff still doesn't work without a well-designed product that people can talk about. Lastly, um, refinement has to be part of every process. Um, so every single product has a feedback mechanism where you can, you can take it, you can learn, see what's working, what's not, move on. App reviews, encouraging people to leave it, that is one feedback mechanism. The thing I love to measure is net promoter score, which is basically, it's a lot of times you guys will see that survey pop up, how likely are you to recommend this product to a friend, one to 10. Um, from eight to 10, those are known as your promoters. Um, I think it's one to five that are your detractors. And you take all that, you take why, and you build it in, you get yourself a score. And the best marketing tool you can have is a well-designed product, and they tell you because they're going to talk about it. And that's a really important tool, and it helps you figure out whether you're on the right track or not. Intercom's another wonderful tool that lets you get feedback uh, throughout the application experience. And certainly social media, the conversation's already happening out there. But you gotta just figure out what you're doing well or you're not. Listen to customers, but don't always take them literally. We had people admit asking us for manual transaction entry constantly. And the problem with that is then that screws up the whole automated balance system. So we would have made the product much more complicated for the vast majority of people if we had listened to this very uh, vocal minority. So you gotta like basically take the, take the input, understand what they really need, not what they're literally asking for. Um, so these people, like we ended up delivering the transactions for them, which did the trick, and they were happy. Um, but it didn't screw up the experience for everybody else that was happy. And whatever input you're getting, maybe you have a hypothesis on how to fix it. We always hear stuff, and we're just like, oh, here's like 20 different ideas on how to fix that. Um, it's not always obvious. In fact, it's rarely obvious. Test your hypotheses, figure out that is in fact the right solution, um, and move on. And always remember the vision. Like, what do you, what do you set, what did you set out to do in the first place? And don't like, don't necessarily go deviate unless you really learn some very, very troubling things that invalidate your entire business. Learn to love failure. Make frequent small improvements. That's very important. And another tool is to kill a feature to see if anyone cares. That's a big one. If you can start to like keep adding adding things, then you can just kill it to it and see if anyone cares. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, again, please ask me questions. Um, I'll be around. We'd love to see how I can help you guys. All right? Thank you very much for coming. Actually, we can do a few questions. Um, does anybody have any questions for Jason? That would be great. He, he left you silent. No, no question. One, oh, there we go. Can you get your presentation if we tweet at you? Can you get the presentation if they tweet at you? I actually had a dream last night that I was doing this and like that was like, can we get the slides? Yes, you can get the slides. <laughs> I will put out slides for you guys. Okay, we're going to do one more here. Oh, Uh, the question was, what kind of resources would you recommend for people who want to get self-taught? Um, actually, there's, I, I, I read. I mean, I, I taught myself how to code by reading books. Um, actually, if you go on um, Google and like, look for like my name, Cora, and books, I actually have uh, a list of like basically breaking down like which kinds of things you want to read. So um, definitely reading books and also just doing it. Um, like the stuff that I showed off here, this isn't like, like designing is not some like mystery of the universe, you know, it's like go out there, like listen to people, hear their stories. You guys are all users of technology, use smartphones, use computers, like, like do it. Like go out, start drawing stuff, put it in front of people, if they like it, if they hate it, like do it again. And with anything, like more, the more times you do it, the more times you practice, um, you're gonna get pretty good at it, so. All right, well, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, hold on, we got two more questions. Here, here, okay, go ahead. Hi, um, so you talked um, about features, and it's something that I, now that we've gone live, live, I have trouble with. Um, lots of features that people are requesting, and they serve both user and business needs. And um, do you have any quick tips on how to really prioritize this influx, especially when you get limited resources? Yeah, um, that happens to have a, oh, excuse me, uh, the question was basically if you're getting a lot of feature requests, um, users have ideas or sending feature requests. Um, how do you decide and how do you prioritize? Um, for me, it goes back. It goes back to vision. 
um, you know basically where this thing needs to go in order to get, like you have a vision of the future that is different um, than like what, what it is today, right? Your part is gonna get you from here to there. And um, run it through the vision lens. And um, as in terms of evaluating, maybe if you don't even know that, um, you could figure out, like there, there has to be some kind of way to figure out, well, what impact is this going to have? If, if all things are equal, it's, it's tough to say if they're all equal. I mean, you're the designer, like you know best, I'd say just, just try it. But um, if you but quantify it, see the impact, you know, run experiments. If we launch this feature out, 10% of users, what happens? Um, being a software designer is almost not fair because we get to like try things, all kinds of different samples. We can experiment, we can kill features, we can adapt. Um, if you're building a piece of hardware, uh, you can't do that. So um, that's another tactic for you. All right. We have one more question in the back, and then we've got to get going on the next session. This is a really interesting. So go ahead. You mentioned uh, PR and marketing as part of the core strategy and getting traction with it. I just want to hear your some of your insights on how that was that part of your overall strategy or from the beginning, or is that something you you saw a need for as you were going through the project? Um, Where's KR marketing fit into sure. this whole thing? Yeah, uh, this was uh, this is something we always thought thought of from the beginning. Now, if you launch like something like a social network, um, you need it to be social. You need to have some kind of viral hook, and you need to basically build that product so that it starts growing on its own. And you don't really want to apply any marketing resources or money or ads or any any of that until you know that it's working. For Mint, um, it's something that we knew we needed to rely on from the very beginning because it was a non-social product. It was just, you, you go, you sign up, and we monetize based on that. So we had to basically go out and get users somehow. And a lot of people pan marketing in PR, but for us it's incredibly effective. Um, the marketing tools we used were pretty, pretty cost effective. SEO, like SEO doesn't require a huge amount of money. Um, you just need time and investment, but then it pays off in a big way. Um, I actually wrote, a lot on this, um, also on Quora. It's like if you look for my name and like how to make game traction. There's actually a whole, a whole bunch of things on it. But um, for us, it was it, it comes back to knowing who the customer was, and we also had the benefit of a timing. Uh, Mint launched into the uh, you know one of the you know an economic recession when everybody was trying to figure out um, how to cut back, where to save, and uh, and where to spend properly. So we had that narrative. Um, we knew all of our different markets. We pitched different reporters. Like here's, you know, here's like Essence magazine. We're gonna go pitch them on this particular angle. We're gonna pitch Parade on this particular angle. And then you have like the I can teach you to be rich guys. We could pitch them on uh, kind of money hacking. So figure out what that story is and what the audiences or what the reporters are looking for. What their audience was key, and that's something you can do for free. Um, so it was always very important. Yes. All right. Let's hear it for Jason. Great.